Imagine with me for a second that you are just walking along on campus and you find a little piece of paper that has about five sentences on it. The top part is torn, the bottom part is torn, and all you get is this little glimpse of what appears to be part of a larger letter. You don't know who sent it, who it was uh, sent to, who wrote it, I should say, who it was sent to. You don't know the purpose of it. You don't know what came before. You don't know what came after. You just have those five sentences. But you're intrigued because there's content in those five sentences that intrigues you. Well, that's kind of where we're at this morning. We're looking at this part of a letter. And it can be difficult if you don't remember what came before to understand exactly the impact of those sentences. So this morning, we are dropping into this letter that Paul has written to the young believers in and around Ephesus, people that he loves, people that he's really concerned about. We drop in, and if all we see are these five sentences, we think he's giving them a list of instructions. But he's not only doing that. Because remember what's come before. You all have been just fed this year on what has come before. Everything that's come before Ephesians 4.25, you've been having a steady diet of that. And that, I hope you see that as an amazing blessing in your lives. Well, what has come before? Paul starts off in this beautiful letter giving these young believers this rich, artistic hymn filled with beautiful words that seem to just spill out of his mouth, that seem to be overflowing from a heart that's full of gratitude for all of the rich blessings in Christ. That's where he starts. He wants these people to know all that they have in Christ. Ephesians 1, 1 tells us, God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Christ Jesus. So he wants them to know who they are. He wants them to know that they are chosen. He wants them to know that they are loved and that they are now part of God's family. And then he moves on in chapter two. I'm just reminding you, you've heard all this this year if you've been faithful to be here in chapel. In chapter two, he reminds them that because of God's rich mercy, they are saved by grace and not by works that no one should boast. So he's established their identity as chosen, as family, and he tells them of their purpose, that they are his workmanship created for good works in Christ. So because of all these true things, we get to chapter four that starts off. So walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And you heard it, I I heard, you heard and I heard online the great message from that first part of chapter four. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Well now, we're pressing down into chapter four. Now we're looking at verses 25 to 32 and now he gets, Paul gets specific. What does it look like to walk in a manner worthy of your calling? That's what we're gonna look at today. We're gonna dive into these words here. What does it look like to walk in a manner worthy of your calling? Let's pray. Father, help us this morning to recognize that these words that we are going to talk about this morning come from your very mouth through Paul's pen to our ears and to our hearts. God, we forget sometimes these are your very words. Help us to be respectful of them. Help us to be eager to take them and to ingest them and to apply them to our lives. Help us, Lord, not to be hearers only, but doers in your name. Amen. Okay, if you want to follow along with me, Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. Here we go. Therefore, and therefore, right? It's built on everything that we just reviewed from chapter one through three. Having put away falsehood, Let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, 
but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Well at the heart of this passage is God's instruction for us to be kind to one another and he gives us the reason that that's important and he gives us the way that that's possible. And so that's what we're gonna look at together this morning. That's not gonna work. So we're gonna dive into three points this morning to do that. Number one, by God's design, we are so connected we are members of one another. Second, kindness should characterize the new self. And third, forgiveness is the key to tenderhearted love. That's where we're headed. So number one, by God's design, we are in Christ, and therefore we are so connected that we are members of one another. Our oneness in Christ and one another is a prominent theme in this little letter. Paul emphasizes this relationship that we have with the exalted Christ in a way that's unique. He wants us to know that the church has this beautiful relationship with Christ. Perhaps you've picked up on this theme of you, as you've gone through Ephesians, but he uses this term in Christ 34 times. He wants us to get it. We are in Christ. He wants you to know that there's corporate solidarity with Jesus. And we have this new existence created by God and it should be characterized in a certain way. And when we have this relationship with him, we have a relationship with one another. It's like spokes of a wheel. Jesus is at the center. And as we are all connected to Jesus at the center, we're all connected to one another. We are members of one another. And I think that Paul is amazed. He emphasizes this because I think he is amazed at this truth. God gave him this job of stewarding the mystery of the truth that the Gentiles are grafted into the people of God. And when we remember that Paul used to persecute those same people, I think he was just overwhelmed by the truth that they are now part of the same body. These people who he persecuted, now he tells us the dividing wall of hostility has been abolished and that God has made us both one and created in himself one new man in the place of two, thereby killing the hostility. And I think he isn't just telling the people in and around Ephesus. I think he's telling himself. I think he's saying, this might sound crazy, but it's really true. We're all part of one another. The unsearchable riches that belonged only to us are theirs. Can you believe it? I think he's saying to his own heart and to these people. And then he draws this conclusion, if God can do that, then his love is huge. And if his love is huge, then he can help us to love one another. So he goes on, he gives us specific ways that we're supposed to love one another. He says, don't lie. Tell the truth to one another, for we are members of one another. One of the ways that we love one another is by telling the truth. Do you love your friends by telling them the truth about their identity in Christ? Do you love your roommate by helping him or her uh, be aware of the sin that they're in? Do you tell the truth by not embellishing stories to make yourself look better than you are? We have to tell the truth because we are members of one another. Do you see yourself as part of the body? If we think about our body parts lying to one another, we wouldn't be able to get through our day. Right, if my eyes lied to my foot about how far that step is, I would fall down and be really embarrassed in front of all of you. If your eyes lied to your hands, you would crash your car and 
not even be able to write on a piece of paper, never, or text, you wouldn't be able to even text. Our body parts cannot lie to one another and still function the way we're supposed to function, and that's true with the body of Christ. So Paul goes on, verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let anger linger to the point where it becomes bitterness. It's so easy to deal with a little bit of anger if we let the, the sun go down on that, that becomes bitterness that settles into our hearts. And unresolved anger harms the body of Christ, which is why he puts it here. He doesn't want us to relate within the body of Christ in this way. Verse 28, don't steal, he tells us. Don't steal. Labor, work hard. Why? So you can share with the needy. These instructions that he's giving us have to do with how we can love each other better. There are don'ts, but the reason is so that we can love our members better. He's saying be honest with your money so you can lovingly meet the needs of those around you. Do you think about your money in that way? Do you think about your labor in that way? Are you motivated to be honest with your money so that you can be a blessing to the community around you? Verse 9, 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. This one gets right up in our business, gets right up in your grill. Even your language is to be used to build up the community. We can be so flippant with our language. But the very words that come out of our mouths, the very sentences that we form, can either corrupt and tear down or build up. It's a choice we make with every sentence that comes out of our mouths. Tearing down with our words is so easy, and building up requires self-control, maybe some planning, maybe some tool, proper tools, some intentionality, but it's all motivated by the purpose, it tells us here, to give grace to those who hear. Grace, undeserved favor. Undeserved favor, that means that if that person that you're talking to, you don't think they deserve grace, you don't think they deserve favor. That's the whole point. <laughs> we give it even though it's undeserved because that's how God gave grace to you and to me. It's undeserved. We don't wait until the person that we're interacting with deserves some sort of gracious communication from us. We do it because we were given grace first and we have an opportunity with our words to build up, to use words that are fitting to that occasion, that it may give grace to those that hear. Grace is something that we all ache for. Sometimes we beg for it. Sometimes we forget that God's given it to us freely. But we know for sure that it's undeserved. And since God has offered us that undeserved grace, can we not discipline ourselves enough to offer grace to others with our words and choose words that build up instead of words that corrupt and tear down? I think within our culture, we have um, what we, we experience that getting things off our chest seems to be the norm and we think that it's somehow therapeutically uh, beneficial to us if I can just get this off my chest, just let me vent. Just, I, just, I just gotta be real, so just let me vent, instead of realizing that perhaps what we're saying when we vent is tearing down and not building up. We need to think about ways that our words can love other people. And we excuse other people too when we say, well, you just gotta do you. No, no, you gotta do us, we're an us. I 
I need to think about how my words build up the body of Christ and not tear down. So Paul tells us don't lie, don't steal, don't be angry, don't sin in our anger I should say, don't corrupt with your language, these are the don'ts. He gives, gives us the reason because we're part of one another. We are so connected in Christ that we are actually members of one another. And so how we treat our money, how we use our language affects the body. So put off, those things belong to the old self. Put off the old self, Paul tells us. But he doesn't just leave us there. Now we turn to put on the new self. And he says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And this leads us to our second point, which is kindness should characterize the new self. We've put off, put off. Now we're gonna, he's telling us, put on. Put on kindness. Because we're connected to one another, be kind to one another. And all of the points that we just mentioned, the truth telling, the grace filled words, the sharing, are only genuinely possible when we have tender hearts toward the body of Christ. Paul uses this word tender hearted to describe Christian kindness here. And I love this word. If you were like me, you were brought up being told that you just need to be nice. Be nice to your sister, be nice to the neighbors, be nice to the cat, whatever it is, just be nice. I was told to be nice a lot. And I was a firstborn and I pretty much usually did what my parents said, so I, I tried to be nice. This is so much more than being nice. So much more than being nice. I don't know, it gets me a little choked up. This is not manners, John Piper tells us. This is not an outward reformation of manners. This isn't just saying thank you to the person at the habit who just gave you this amazing burger. <laughs> this is an inward renovation of the heart. It matters. It matters. Oh, sorry. Not sorry. <laughs> My husband always says, don't say sorry when you cry. Not sorry. <laughs> the heart of the new self, the heart of the new self has been tenderized. It's been made soft. Do you guys know what a meat tenderizer is? Are there any cooks in here? These things are deadly. Like, I don't know if you can see it. But these, this is metal, and these are pokey. <laughs> I mean, this would seriously hurt if it hit you. It's large pokies on one side and smaller pokies on the other, and it's metal. And if you wallop a piece of meat with this, well, your piece of meat isn't alive, so it wouldn't hurt the meat. But if you hit somebody, this would really hurt. But this tool is used when you buy a piece of meat that's cheap, and rot, tough, it's tough, and so you just hit the thing. You break down the connective tissue in that piece of meat. It becomes thinner, more pliable, softer, better to eat. That's what this tool is for, and this is called a meat tenderizer. It makes meat tender. Paul is saying that kindness is tender-heartedness. A heart that has been wounded is sensitive to the wounds of others. A heart that's been tenderized by our own foolish choices and actions or by things that have happened to us that we have no control over, it tenderizes our hearts. I remember about 18 years ago, I got a, was working teaching here, on faculty here, I got a call from home saying that my parents' marriage was coming to an end. 
and even at 35, that was devastating. I was finishing up my doctoral dissertation. I put it aside for a week, and I laid on the couch. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> I laid on the couch and I cried for about a week. And when I walked across this campus, my heart was so different. It was so tender. Y'all were just being born then, so you weren't here, but I walked across this campus and I, looked, I would look at students and I would think, what's burdening your heart? What's, what makes you sad? I seriously wanted to run up to every student and hug them. Because my heart was so tender that it was tender toward others. Some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Other people's sorrow moves me. The plight of 150 million orphans in the world moves me. Joyful things move me as well. <laughs> Joyful stories of victory in Christ move me. Salvation stories move me. Serving the Lord's Supper at my church moves me. Witnessing 13 baptisms last night in my church moved me. My heart is tender because I realize that I am one with the body of Christ and also because I realize I've been forgiven much. Just how much kindness and tenderheartedness is necessary. This passage tells us that it's enough, there has to be enough kindness to replace all that old self, all that bitterness and anger and malice and slander and lying. It has to be enough to replace all of that. A tender heart is part of the new nature. It's replacing that old nature that has gone in. It's not a decision. It's not just a decision, it's a character trait. We can't just say, oh come on, I gotta go be kind today. No, it's a character trait. It overflows from a heart that has changed. It is the new self. Kindness is the new you in Christ. And to whom are we to show this tender kindness, tender-hearted kindness? Well, in other places in the Bible, it's clear that we're to care for the needy, the orphans, the widows, the hungry. We're to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. But here, it's striking that this tender-hearted kindness is directed to our churches, to our members. It's extravagant love in everyday life. It's not reserved for your annual mission trip to the orphanage or your weekly trip down to Skid Row. It's for every day. And what God is telling us today is that he wants us to feel full-hearted, warm affection toward the body of Christ, those that sit next to you every Sunday. And how do we do it? How can we show tender kindness to those who have wronged us or annoy us or even those people that we don't know? Well, that leaves us hungry for point three. Point three, forgiveness is the key to tender-hearted love. So let's read verse 32 again. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind-hearted, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. We learn two really things, two really important things in this verse. First, God hates bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice. And he doesn't want them to be part of your lives. And second, all of that can be put away from you. It says, let it all be put away from you. This is passive. It's not saying, you, put it away. Put it away right now. Get up and stamp your foot and say, be put away. No, it's passive. You are passive. Jesus, his death, his resurrection enables us to be true. That When we are in Christ, we can let it all be put away. We don't have to live there. Let it be put away from you. Paul must have felt some of this. 
some of these things, some of this malice and anger and before he was converted. He's, he can relate. In Christ, it can all be put away. God does the, God does the putting away in Christ. And then we can ask the Holy Spirit, help us know our forgiveness, the forgiveness that we've been given in Christ. God didn't wait until we deserve to be forgiven. And we can't make, we can't wait until others deserve it either. So how should we respond to this passage? We have to identify ourselves with something bigger than ourselves. We are united with Christ and therefore with one another and so we can let our sin be put away from us and forgive one another as Christ forgave us. And in place of that old self, put on the new self, a kind, tender-hearted self who edifies the body of Christ. Now you've likely heard the, the quippy saying that hurt people hurt people. And that's often really true and really sad. But the opposite is true too, that forgiven people forgive people. And that loved people love people. Six years ago, I'm not gonna get through this one, people. God dropped a six-year-old little boy in our lives, in our family. Let me give a picture. There's our precious family. But six years ago, God dropped our son Sam into our lives. We weren't seeking for Sam. <laughs> we hadn't done any of the work that you're supposed to do to adopt a child. God brought him to our, our family and dropped him into it. His situation was desperate. It was our house for the foster care system at that point. And he had experienced tumultuous and traumatic six years. Sam is the tall, handsome boy on the right. He came to us hurt, hardened, distrusting of adults for lots of very valid reasons. He was defensive, he was aggressive. And we have, mir- we have witnessed a miracle in this boy an unbelievable miracle in this boy. Through consistent, kind, safe, healthy, tender-hearted love shown to Sam. After six years, he's 12 here in this picture, and slowly catching up with me in height. (laughs) He has a tender heart. There were people who knew him when he was six who said, It's impossible. He will not love other humans ever in a tender-hearted way. They were wrong. This boy who once threatened us now thanks God for us every time he prays. At 12, he kisses us goodbye every morning in front of his school. He tells me I'm beautiful. He gets teary when he sees a homeless person or a dog with a limp. And every time Eric and I hug, we're standing up hugging, Sam runs over and he sticks his head right in the middle of us because he doesn't want to miss out on a hug. He used to fit right here, now he has to bend over to get his head right in here. This is a tender-hearted, amazing boy. I don't tell you about him because I want you to think he's amazing, although he is. He's tender-hearted, because guys, I want you to get it, God does that. God makes us tender-hearted when we recognize that we're part, big, part of something bigger than ourselves, and we recognize the forgiveness that we have in Christ. We can be tender-hearted people, kind to one another. This is the new self. This is the new you. Only God changes people like that, but he uses us to do it. He uses us to show kindness to one another, to bring that about in people. So rest in God's lavish 
forgiveness and love for you in Christ and love people extravagantly and tenderheartedly in Jesus' name. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.